So in the context of credential stuffing, for me personally, I think about like the username and password field of a web page, you know, some web form or whatever. Are there other areas that people, you know, come after in the context of credential stuffing or maybe help us understand, you know, what they're going after on all these things? Sure. I, I like to think of it as uh, inherent vulnerabilities versus inadvertent vulnerabilities. Inadvertent mm -hmm. vulnerabilities are those that can be patched, like the cross-site scripting, SQL injection, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. The inherent vulnerabilities can't be patched because they result from a critical business requirement. Like you could, I guess you could take down your login page and right. then you would not be vulnerable to credential stuffing, but that doesn't seem like a good thing for many, many companies. Um, so it's uh, really abusing applications intended use, right? That's yeah. what credential stuffing is. Uh, so, but a lot of people think that's the only inherent vulnerability, but it's not. Um, I don't know if this was covered in the report, but the uh, typical login success rate for a credential stuffing attack is anywhere from 0.1 to 3%. Uh, and these are, by the way, we're seeing them in the uh, millions, hundreds of millions, and even in the billions in, in size. So when you're trying that many username password pairs, a 0.1 to 3% login success rate starts to compromise a lot of accounts. But it isn't just login, it's uh, forgot password. If uh, it gives feedback to the attacker to let them know whether or not the account exists, you're gonna see automated attacks against the forgot password application, against the uh, uh, create account application, against the check gift card balance, uh, it, it, virtually every vertical is impacted for all those public facing applications. So maybe help us understand kind of that whole, you know, life cycle. Yeah, you know, I, I think this is one of those things that's easier to, to just show with some images. Um, yeah. So so we've actually got sort of a breakdown of, of what the entire life cycle looks like from the moment it starts getting from the, the moment those creds are stolen and they start getting used by the original attackers and then the way that kind of spreads. Yeah. So, so awesome. okay. what, what this is, it, this thing is a, a little bit confusing. So I'm going to kind of start a little context here, but that line right in the middle that says days since announcement, <clears throat> that is the moment when the when the victim organization finds out that people are sharing their creds on the internet, and that's the moment when they announce and say, "Hey, we've had a breach." Gotcha. Um, and so, so that that's not days from the attack. That's days from when they find out that they've already successfully been breached, right? Uh, and and so the the point here is that the most of the time detection of these kinds of breaches is is unfortunately pretty bad, right? So after the actual breach event has happened, but before anybody's wise about it, there's this amazing window for the original attackers. It's usually a very small number of sophisticated folks and, and the word's not out. So they can they can use these things and, and usually exploit them to get as much money as they can. And because these guys are savvy, they don't, they don't give themselves away, right? So this is sort of like the low and slow stealthy attack pattern, right? Mm. And then at a certain point, these folks who all don't necessarily trust each other, they sort of realize that, that word is getting out among the slightly broader community and people are saying, oh man, they have these creds and they're actually succeeding. And so in order to preempt their own business partners sharing it with other folks, they end up sharing it. So it's kind of this like chaotic mm -hmm. anarchistic thing, right? And so as the credentials become a little bit more widespread, we get into this this ramp up phase, right? And then you can see what this graph, I'm sorry, I, I'm getting way ahead of myself. What this graph actually shows is attack volume. And this was part of that whole tracing project that I alluded to earlier, so that we, we took a number of credentials that were known to have been breached um, and traced their use against a number of shaped customers. And, and this was the outcome, right? So at a certain point, when the word starts to get around that community, that there's this set of creds that are still good and nobody's reset their passwords yet, more and more people start to use them. And so that's what this ramp up is in traffic. But inevitably, you know, the word gets around, you can't keep a secret, right? And so that's usually what ends up resulting in either a dark web monitoring service or something like that. Somebody saying, hey, there's a huge pile of creds out there that people are using for this purpose. And so then the, then the organization is tipped off and then the organization announces. And from there, it's only a matter of time before most folks are going to go change their password, right? You get that annoying letter in the mail with the off, offer for credit monitoring, all that, right? Yeah. And then so once the word is out and the announcement's released, that's day zero as far as 
the organization is concerned, but the attackers have been partying for, for a quarter, right? So at this point, it's just a total free for all. And everybody, and, and at this point, we're like way down the, the, the ladder of sophistication. We've got kind of anybody on the dark web who can get their hands on these things is just not just going after the original target. They're spraying these things, these, these, this combination of username and password against whatever target they can think of. And that's when you get this huge blitz. At this point, the sophisticated people are kind of long gone, right? The, the secret's out. It's no good anymore. And eventually everyone changes their password or everything that is, that is there within those accounts to be stolen has already been stolen, right? So then you get this kind of long ramp down and it kind of settles into a new equilibrium. But one of the interesting things about it is that there will always be somebody who's just kind of getting into this, some total beginner who's gonna keep trying those creds a little bit. So we notice that across all these targets where we ch were tracing the creds, that the equilibrium was always a little bit higher in this stage four than it was in the very beginning when the original attackers were going low and slow, right? So there's this kind of whole arc where you have pre-discovery, sophisticated attackers, and then it sort of disseminates to a wider and wider part of the attacker community. And then inevitably cover gets blown, the opportunity is gone, and then the, the reincarnation stage is after this. Um, it, eventually, somebody in that community is going to take all these passwords, rebundle them up, and either try to resell them again as another collection, trade them for some something else of value uh, within the, the cybercrime community. Uh, and, and this goes back to what we were talking about 10 minutes ago about password reuse, right? So it's like that combo, that username password against a given target, that might not be good anymore. But a good attacker knows that most of us just sort of increment our passwords by one or whatever. We have all these stupid rules that help us remember, but are actually extremely easy for machines to exploit. And so the fact that we all reuse our password is what makes that reincarnation stage still viable for attackers. So, so this whole life cycle thing, this, I think this is, this is so cool. This is the first time I've ever seen anything like this in the field. I just want to reiterate the implication of this. Many of you probably know that, you know, NIST and others recommend that you, you know, you, you kind of mine the dark web for credentials and then you can check your customers' credentials against those in this corpus from dark web uh, and keep them from, you know, using them, keep them from creating new accounts with them. Well, what, what Sanders describing here is during that period there, Sage One, it's not on the dark web. Um, so it isn't enough just to mine the dark web for these uh, spilled credentials. Um, so at Shape, a lot of the intelligence we glean are from the, the currently exploited credentials. During this phase one, they are, they are launching credential stuffing attacks against the Shape network. So we're able to get early insight into what credentials are, are spilled well before they wind up in the dark web. I think that's a very important point to reiterate. And the, the fact that we were even able to do this project really shows how important it is that people can start to share intel and, and say, hey, this is what we're seeing. These combos are showing up again and again and again because we, we all reuse accounts, like we all reuse our personal email as the username, and then we all reuse passwords because passwords are stupid and hard to remember. So as Shape sits in front of a web application to protect it, um, inherently it's obviously protecting from a lot of this credential stuffing attack so maybe help us understand like maybe a little bit of high level how that works, if that's all right. Well, yeah, sure. We just inject some JavaScript that collects a lot of signals. We have an SDK that sits alongside a native app as well to uh, collect signals from the devices, uh, uh, you know, uh, mobile devices. Uh, passes all those signals through uh, one of our appliances and we analyze those signals and make a real time decision whether or not it's good or bad. If it's bad, we take some mitigating action. If it's good, we strip off the payload and pass it to origin. So um, the good traffic reaches origin, the bad traffic uh, doesn't. But I should highlight that not all um, you know, countermeasures are perfect. Uh, even with shape in line, deploying its signals and taking mitigating action, uh, there will be some malicious traffic uh, getting past shape, mm -hmm. which is why it's important to have a second stage where you have your AI and ML systems that are monitored by humans. You got to have the carbon units, dozens of them, pouring over those alerts, making sure there are no false positives or false negatives. Uh, mm -hmm. But once you find malicious traffic, then you need the ability to update your real-time defenses. And that's what Shape offers its customers, an outcome of a service. Um, we just keep updating stage one as we find, uh, you know, malicious traffic in our, in our retrospective, what we call stage two. And that just continues into perpetuity. Uh, and as a result of this, you know, we have... Uh, 
literally billions of transactions flowing through Shape every day. Uh, and so what my team does is we're a bunch of data scientists and analysts, investigators who just pour over that data looking for interesting insights like, you know, huge attacks or new monetization schemes or new tools, those sorts of things. So that's kind of what shape, what shape, in the beginning, by the way, we were all about bot, no bot, okay? If, is it human or not? Right. Uh, but when the signals evolved, they got quite good. Now we're like studying how the environment does floating point math and, and drawing conclusions based on that. And now our signals have become so good, we're, we're able to tell good humans from bad humans. Uh, and then even for the good humans, we're able to take steps to minimize uh, the friction uh, for those user experiences. Well, hey, I know we are just about out of time. We say this every time and it's, I guess it's true, but time flies on these things. I love them. I love them. Just kind of talking and getting all the great, this has been an amazing time, but we wanted to give you guys just a quick moment, any kind of last thoughts. So, uh, so maybe Sander, we'll start with you and then Dan give you a, a final word. If you guys have anything you wanted to, to say here at the end. I essentially, what, what I would like to drive home to everybody is, Take this threat seriously because this is probably the single largest threat and it also empowers all these other kinds of threats as well. So take this extremely seriously because this is probably where the war is going to be fought for the next five years. Nice. Yeah, hot topic. Awesome, man. Thanks so much, Sander. Dan, how about you? I just say don't use CAPTCHA uh, ever. There's just <laughs> no place for it. I hate it. Every time I, I see one, it makes my blood boil. They don't work. Uh, human click farms are solving those for bots all day long. Um, so they just create friction. So I encourage everybody to abandon the CAPTCHA, any of them, reCAPTCHA, fun CAPTCHA, and none, none of it's fun.